broader issues and assessment. Um, so, there, assessment, right? Uh, I'm going to start with group discussion. So, yeah, as Lily had said, I've been happy to move into groups. They started out being set up in groups, but I think some of them have migrated. Um, I've counted 16 here, so maybe four groups of four or less would be the easiest way to group things together. And um, I thought it would be good to just sort of seed uh, this with some discussion about assessment before we get started. Um, I'm also going to, because we're not a large group today, I might take a, a moment after we come back together and before we start speaking together to actually do introductions. I haven't done it before because the groups have been bigger, but this is a manageable size. It would be nice to walk out of here knowing a few more names than I know right now. Um, so, uh, three simple, well, not so simple questions. Three questions. Um, so, what are the goals of writing assessment? Um, and what assessment practices do you engage in most frequently? And again, thinking about writing. If you don't teach writing, feel free to chime in with whatever uh, topics you might teach. And also, are there any hidden agendas in providing feedback? Um, for example, uh, to prove that we're doing our jobs. Um, because, uh, well, I'll just I'll leave that there with you. Um, so three questions. Let's just take about five to ten minutes. We'll see how it goes. I usually kind of listen for things to get quieter and then I uh, interrupt. So, uh, and then we'll come back together and talk about these uh, as a group. So, we'll give you five to ten minutes. So I'm interested to hear what some of the things you talked about are, um, and I'll write some notes on the board if you could see them. Like as I was just saying, I'm sorry that everything on the board is going to be about this high and below. So um, no, in my university we have these great tall boards, and it's kind of hilarious that it's like, well, what do people do with those boards on, on top? I have no idea. Um, so um, let's start. Here, sorry, we'll put you on the spot as the last group to arrive, but hopefully you got through the first question. Um, so what do you think are some of the goals of writing assessment, or just assessment if you don't teach writing, it's okay to generalize? Oh, I just know it's person. We think uh, we're just assessing whether the students have achieved the, 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 the silos, yeah, the uh, course in ten without learning outcomes. Okay. So, um, I guess writing assessing is kind of redundant, but, um, so outcomes. Okay, because we have achievement. Um, got the group here in the center. Uh, we thought about it, like, as from more, like, from the academic literacy part, you know, because writing different things from Speaking, speaking, you don't have to go to school to speak. Uh, but you know, writing, you do need to go to go through right. the formal learning process you know, to be writing in an appropriate context. Okay, so academic literacy goals. And also gradually to move into workplace, you know, kind of communication. So it's preparing them for working for the whole life, like us. Finding a plan, learning plans. And also to practice writing. Practice? Practice writing. Yeah, use lots of abbreviations. <laughs> Different genres of, of writing. 
right. right. In our case, I think I need to But not necessarily because we teach ESP as well. So workplace right. Right, yeah. I mean, then there could be, yeah, email. And whether they have the, the, whether they have the sense or the ability to, to write from a perspective of representing somebody else, like representing a company or an organization. Okay, yeah, genre and, yeah, I like that word representation. Here's where my, my writing comes apart. I may have to crack, move into another section here. Uh, this group, anything to add? Well, you mentioned uh, assessment for learning. And oh, so yeah. students can learn various skills through the writing assessment. Let's, just as a, uh, one example, uh, collaborative writing. Uh, they can learn uh, teamwork skills and planning skills and things like that. So. Okay, good. Yeah, so lots of great ideas here about what um, assessment can do. Um, I mean, of course, there are all these different types of assessment and different goals associated with them, whether, you know, we're using assessment to teach students new things or to report to a third party. Um, you know, the, some other interested party that needs that assessment information. So there's um, different types of um, goals that come into play there. Um, what about practices? I'm curious. So what, when you're assessing student work, what what are the typical practices? And we'll go back to this. We'll do the last group first and work the other way around the room. So you don't always have to be the group that says um, what they said. Just drop writing and then uh, administering student-teacher feedback along the way. Okay, so, so they submit their, their assignments in different stages. Okay, so uh, assigning different stages. Um, we'll call it stages of writing. And, and just whether it's in class, outside of class. Okay, so yeah, the in versus out of class. Assessment practices. Um, this group here. Uh, providing feedback, so, reading, uh, providing comments. Okay, feedback and comments. In what form? Written or? Um, maybe written. Okay. I'm thinking in most cases. Um, depending on how much time you have. Yeah, I mean, I think written comments are probably the most common. Uh, uh, you know, some people use other forms, conferencing, um, recorded audio feedback. We do that as well. Okay. We do that as well. We have consultations. Okay. So mainly written, but less consultation. Yeah. Can be an examination. Yeah. Uh, or international or uh, internal. Yeah, straightforward. <laughs> Sometimes the obvious one is uh, uh, from the group and back. So we talked about the moderation to calibrate our understanding of the group, and then also um, focus groups, so to uh, talk to students. And so moderation yeah. and focus groups. Yeah, to understand what the students, how the students feel about the assessments, what's working, what's not. Okay. interested to hear more about how you use that. That's, um, don't, don't hear that that often in um, assessment terms. So. And last group. Same thing. Okay. <laughs> That's what happens with the last group. Sorry. Um, and then finally, hidden agendas. This was a little bit, um, I think, maybe a little trickier question. Um, any thoughts? We'll go back to it. I think you all justify the grade. I give the students yeah. justify the grade. Yeah, to use two breaks.
teachers like try to be really encouraging in their comments, and, like, I really like this paper, and, you know, I think you did a really good job for the introduction, and, like, all this praise, and then the grade is a C. <laughs> but the comments are so positive, why did I get such a low score? Um, and, yeah, so sometimes we have to kind of match the comments with, and it, yeah, it's unfortunate, um, in a way, because you do want to be encouraging, but when you have to worry about, oh, I can't be too encouraging, because it's actually not, you know, a top score paper. But here, any other agendas you could think of? I just said the same thing, a accountability. Uh, I mean, doing your job, kind of, you know, yeah. professionalism. Uh, as a course coordinator, I have 42 instructors. I, I, I mean, I need them to be able to explain why they gave the grades they gave. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and I like that professionalism, accountability. Did you come up with something else? You spoke about the justifying to students the grade, um, that accountability, and also the, the ethical agenda going back to the practices of giving, you know, it's not really an agenda, but making sure that they can improve if your assessment is long term or like you have a scaffold in the site. Oh. match of the, the assessment type. How about going around here? Uh, one thing we thought about, and I've written minimize workload, so that if you're writing feedback on a, on a piece of writing from a student, you can't write on every student's paper, come and see me to discuss your paper. <laughs> <laughs> then, you, then if you teach like 50 students at five or four or whatever, then you've got so you've got to sort of rationalize. And also the professional thing in terms of our appraisal as teachers, then um, usually we have to produce examples of the kind of feedback that we give to students. Yes, good. Yeah, definitely. And, um, well, I'll talk about one other one that has come up for me recently. But last group, yes, last group. Anything to add? Um, Student evaluations. Yeah, but, but I'm not sure what kind of feedback might affect your end of term evaluation. Yeah, that's a really good one. Actually, at our student evaluation, that question is asked explicitly. You know, what kind of feedback did you receive, and were you satisfied with the amount and frequency of feedback? And so, if you need those high scores for a promotion, <laughs> then you make sure that students are getting an adequate amount of feedback. Um, another one that came up recently is transferability. When students um, transfer from one program to another, um, sometimes they have to prove that, um, not just with their scores, but um, sometimes the receiving department or the receiving college wants to know, you know, what did your previous instructor think about your writing? And, you know, bring us something with comments on it so that we can see, um, you know, uh, how your writing was, not just that you got a B, but, you know, what did your, your instructor have to say about your writing? So, Christine, you were talking about some accreditation of your uh, institution, right? right? Yeah, exactly. yeah, so. Yeah, so accreditation, transferability, so it's a kind of communication outside of the, you know, either the local context to some larger context to show um, something about the student's ability. Um, okay, so let me see what I did with my clicker. There we go. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about some types of alternative assessments. Um, you may use some of them already, so they may not seem that alternative. Um, but uh, the first being minimal marking. Does anyone here use minimal marking practices? Okay. Well, good. Sometimes, depending so, on how close to deadline. <laughs> <laughs> like not intentionally, but. Uh, uh, and of course, rubrics, um, which I know are you know commonly used, they're not really that alternative. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, collaborative student-created rubrics um, as opposed to teacher-created ones. Um, portfolio assessment, 
Um, I'm going to show you some examples and talk about what our program does uh, with portfolio assessment uh, with first year students. And I put multimodal assessment there. I'm just going to say, not sure we'll get that far. So, um, but I'm going to put it there just in case. Um, yeah, that's very small. Um, so, uh, minimal marking ideas go back to the 1980s. And uh, this quote uh, from Richard Haswell, we'll be looking at a few things he says, um, that to kind of the seminal quotation from him, positive results of teacher intervention through written commentary simply have not yet been found. Um, and uh, then Maxine Harrison, uh, about three years later, numerous corrections combined with long marginal and end comments produce cognitive overload. Uh, the student simply cannot process and absorb the amount of information he or she is getting, much less adequately respond to it. Often the student does not understand the teacher's terminology or cannot recognize the errors identified. Um, and in fact, there's numerous studies that have been done um, looking at student improvement, you know, as correlated with the amount um, of commenting on papers and written feedback. And there are very little evidence, if any, that it actually um, produces improvement um, in student writing on its own. You know, of course, we know there are many other practices we do in conjunction with commenting. Um, but that's sort of why um, I was talking about the hidden agendas. Because if we know this, why do we keep doing what we do. Um, and it is probably because of a number of these other reasons and expectations. Yeah. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that if you have a writing that's submitted at the end of the semester, then the amount of feedback you give, do students actually look at it? Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I mean, I often recommend to our instructors, if it's a final paper that has no hope of being revised, and you know they're basically out the door, the, the feedback is kind of a waste of time because most students won't read it. A lot of our faculty actually ask students on those papers, you know, um, do you want feedback on this final paper and are you going to read it? <laughs> because if they're not, then they're not. That's okay. You know, they're out the door. But um, so a lot of what I've been looking at in assessment in our own program is, you know, how do we kind of justify the practices that we do versus what we know about those practices, uh, and also what we know about workload. Um, because marking papers, commenting, takes an enormous amount of time. And it's um, a particular concern for us for our graduate students who teach writing. Um, they have very specified limits of time that they're supposed to be working each week because they're supposed to be getting their dissertations done and you know doing all the other things graduate students need to do. Um, and yet we find um, graduate students more even than, you know, our writing faculty are being held to the standard of commenting, you know, as they're kind of formulating their careers and they're being kind of watched over more about um, commenting. So it's kind of this crazy train in a way. Um, we're doing a lot of work that there's no evidence it actually um, gets us very far. It eats up an awful lot of time. Um, and, you know, to uncertain ends. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of other possibilities. And one more um, from one of your colleagues here. Um, um, sorry, I had to read from here. As teachers work hard at locating, categorizing, and providing correct answers for students, or even writing almost the entire paragraph or the whole piece for students, they are usurping students' right to learn for themselves also depriving them of the opportunity to develop self-editing skills. Um, and uh, Stopping Composition Slaves, actually, um, she's really echoing Maxine Harrison's article on Composition Slaves. Um, so she pays direct homage to it. But it's a really, if you haven't seen this article of hers, it's a very nicely written, very clear kind of nine separate kind of approaches to assessment um, that are very useful and very clearly explained. Um, yeah, I don't know what I did with this. Um, so this is, um, I'm going to read this out because this is how Haswell explains the method for minimal marking. 
So all surface mistakes in a student's paper are left totally unmarked uh, within the text. These are unquestionable errors in spelling, punctuation, capitalization, and grammar, including pron pronoun antecedents, which is a whole kettle of words right now. Um, each of these mistakes is indicated only with a check in the margin by the line in which it occurs. A line with two checks in it, uh, or by it, for instance, means the presence of two errors, no more, within that boundary of that line. The sum of checks is recorded at the end of the paper and in the grade book. Papers with the checks and other commentary are then returned 15 minutes before the end of class. Students have time to search for a circle and correct the errors. I review the corrections, mending those left undiscovered, miscorrected, or newly generated. Uh, where I feel it useful, mistakes are explained or handbook cited until a student attempts to correct checked errors. The grade on the essay remains unrecorded. So it's just really a system of trying to get students to notice errors. Um, I've seen people use just underlining um, without comments, you know, any places where there might be with problems. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people actually in our program do use this, um, but we have the advantage of having very small classes, um, which allows for a lot of conferencing about what these checks and things mean. Uh, so the process part to discuss the most important errors during the conference with a student or a small group of students. So you could, um, we use a lot of small workshop type things with students. Um, have them all bring their papers in, their drafts, um, sit down at a table with three students and some pizza. Um, we have found pizza is an invaluable contributor to successful student workshops. Um, and uh, talk about um, what's going on in their papers. Um, then, or you can have a whole class discussion where everybody looks at a few papers. Um, you can anonymize them um, so students don't feel picked on. Um, or after you've turned back a draft with your errors checked in the margin, um, have a peer review session um, so students can help each other uh, to find where the mistakes are um, and to talk about them and how to correct them. And then also, and this is something that I've done a lot in the past, is have students keep error logs. Little notebook where they write down their most common mistakes um, and they can write out examples, they can write out explanations, however they want to record it, but something to, so that that error kind of comes to the forefront so they don't keep making the same mistake over and over again. Okay. Um, rubrics, you know, you all know what they are, of course, um, but I wanted to share the one we use in our program with our first year students. Um, Just uh, for a point of discussion, not that this is like, thanks. Um, the answer to rubrics, um, but I want to talk a little bit about how it might be different from your rubrics um, and how we also work on student creative ones. about our program to give this some context. Um, students cannot receive anything lower than a C. Um, they have to have a C or better to pass the class. Um, and that's a requirement for first year writing for us. Um, and that's set by the state government in fact. Um, this is, I think you'll notice, um, it's a very holistic kind of rubric. Um, there are no check boxes, there are no points associated with any of these categories. Um, instructors are in, told just to you know, read each category and kind of think what is the dominant characteristic of any particular paper um, in giving it a score. So I'll give you a couple minutes to read through this and then um, we'll talk about it a bit. Has not yet suffered from too much grade inflation. 
um, and it really distresses students when they have friends at Stanford or Harvard. They say, but my friend's getting all A's. Why am I getting B's? Like, well, because you're working. Um, it's just, you know, I don't know how it's happening. But yeah, in our program, I would say it's, it's probably, I think B's average. Very few students fail. No, we only have about five to six percent failure rate, um, so it's it's really unusual for students to flat out fail the course. Uh, but a good, um, we'll talk a little bit about the kind of holistic nature of this. Uh, but a good question came up about that little starred item at the bottom um, about uh, any essay that's shown to contain intentional plagiarism will receive a non-passing grade. Um, and you know the question is how do you determine intentional? Um, Intentional, uh, in our view, it's usually there's whole, wholesale copied material often from the internet um, that's really easily detectable with no attempt to cite it at all. Um, you know, sometimes things are improperly cited, they don't put quotation marks around it, but yet there'll be an item in the bibliography that that material came from. And so usually um, we work through individual conferences when this comes up. Um, and I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, it's a little off topic, but I'll tell you my favorite plagiarism story. I had a student who was reading it, I mean, he was a junior, and so it should have been a much better paper to start with. I read the first paragraph, and it's like, this just doesn't, something's not right here. So I just copy and I Google it, and it's right out of Wikipedia, word for word, the entire paragraph. Call him in and say, you know, What's going on? Wikipedia? I mean, seriously. Um, and he got this look on his face. He said, oh, I'm really sorry. But actually, my mother wrote the paper, and she didn't know she couldn't use Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked at him and said, you realize this just got worse, right? <laughs> Before you came in, it was just you copied a paragraph of Wikipedia. Now we said your mother writes your papers for you. Um, and um, I asked, why is your mother writing your papers? Well, she's very concerned about my grades. Um, <laughs> I mean, God bless mothers out there, but that's a little too much. Um, he, he was not allowed to continue with the university. Um, uh, but not just because of that. It turns out all kinds of other things that preceded. You had mentioned her mother. Yeah, I know. Actually, I told him, I would be very happy to work with your mother. It seems like she's got promise. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I never got to meet her. Um, but, yeah, so the intentional part is usually wholesale copying of some kind without any attempt to acknowledge um, where it might have come from. Um, but we see lots of cases of unintentional plagiarism um, where maybe a little piece of a quotation, it's not adequately quoted, um, you know, or it's a long summary of something without citing it. Um, and you know, we really see this class, this is an intro level class, as an opportunity to teach citation practices, not just to punish students for what they don't yet know. Um, and so we're very careful not to jump to the conclusion that any plagiarism is intentional. Um, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of gray areas, even you know, out there in the world. I mean, it, I think the university sometimes likes to pretend it's very black and white. You know, what's plagiarized, what's not, it's really not that black and white sometimes. Um, you know, what's considered common knowledge. Um, in one field, something may be common knowledge, in another field, it's not. Um, it needs to be cited. There's just a lot of cases. So this is what we use in our program. Yes? But you don't assess academic connection. You require your students to use citation. Mm -hmm. You don't assess how they do. Right, and not in not in this course. Um, so this is the first of a two course series that they take. The second part, which deals with research um, and much more kind of drilling down deep into citation and academic convention. Um, this they get their feet wet in it. Um, they usually are citing single sources, like they might read a novel in class and have to learn how to cite from an author appropriately and things, so. Uh, I mean, I would love to present this to you as a document without controversy. Um, we've used it in its various forms for 25 years now. 
and we argue about it every single semester. <laughs> and that is the issue, I think, with kind of teacher or top-down generated rubrics. Um, a lot of us can't, we don't really agree on some of the terminology or what it means or how important it is um, or even what we should do with it. Um, you know, what does it mean, dominant characteristics? Um, and it really requires a lot of um, kind of intuitive um, behavior. You know, well, I think this looks like a B. And students, um, students are given a copy of the rubric so they understand um, where it comes from. Um, but it doesn't always make them happy to see what these categories are. And they're much more used to a high school style, what we call high school style rubric, you know, that associates a certain number of points mm -hmm. with different categories of so spelling, you know, one through five points or something like that. I'm, I'm not surprised that uh, Berkeley maybe doesn't have so many A's when you use the word compelling in the A category. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it, you know, um, many a faculty meeting has been spent. Could you tell us what exactly is meant by compelling? Um, um, if what's compelling to me may not be compelling to someone else. Uh, so it's the development of the essay. Yes. Right, the development is compelling, right? It, it pulls you through the organization and things. Um, so another. Uh, approach to this. I mean, we're required to use this, but um, I know a lot of instructors also augment this or supplement it with student-created uh, rubrics. And um, they do it in a couple of different ways. Um, one is they bring in some sample papers for whatever the assignment is, ask students to read some sample papers, um, you know, and then, um, you know, maybe put them up on the projector, read them through together, talk about some of their features, and then sort out, okay, what is it that makes this an effective paper, an ineffective paper, what are the categories, what are the, the specific elements that make for a good paper, um, and to have students articulate that with very little guidance from the teacher. Students know this. They've been exposed to writing the papers their whole lives, right? Um, they've internalized a lot, um, but they haven't always been asked to like really verbalize and be very specific about what is it that should be assessed in a paper. Um, so getting them to name the categories um, and to come up with a rubric and, and to rank order the categories. Okay, you come up with 10 things. Now, which of those are really the most important parts of the paper? You know, where does spelling lie, you know, with respect to overall organization, right? Spelling is a very you know, kind of a minor, it should be counted as a kind of minor thing. And those who came to the first workshop, I kind of made um, a side mention of this. It also brings up a lot of categories. Uh, we learn a lot about how students think about how writing should be assessed that aren't necessarily the ways we're assessing it. Um, and I mentioned in the first uh, workshop, for example, the idea of effort. Um, students often wonder, why isn't there a category for effort there. Um, and it brings up a really good discussion about why we don't grade for effort. Um, because, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm very literal in some ways. You know, I, if I grade something, I want there to be evidence, right? And I can't come up with evidence of effort. I can't, you know, I told them, because when they asked me, well, why do you grade for effort? I said, well, because the only way I'd really do that is to go sit in your dorm room while you're working and watch you and take notes and how long did you work and how hard and, you know, did you, how many times did you look up things in the dictionary or reread the class read? I'm like, you know, I had no idea how you'd do those things. And in the end, it probably doesn't matter. You write a good paper. You write a good paper. We, we don't get assessed on effort in life. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I just the example of the last... No, no parenting, you do actually encourage them because you have a mentor, because yeah. otherwise they say, well, I can never do it, and then that is the case. Yes. <laughs> what we call the participation trophies. Um, but, um, I mean, I used the example in the previous workshop of, you know, imagine you have a surgeon that makes like a horrible mistake, but, you know, okay. she gave it a big effort, you know, I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really matter how hard they tried if they did a really bad job. Um, 
So uh, for students, you know, it, but it also um, kind of evokes this nice discussion about how effort is assumed. You know, I'm going to assume you're going to put effort into your work. You know, um, just in the same way at the university, sometimes students are surprised we don't grade attendance. So I don't grade attendance. I expect attendance. Right? You're expected to be here, but you're an adult who gets to choose and, you know, may be sick or may, you know, just make some choices not to come. Um, but I expect 100% attendance. Um, it's very different than grading attendance. You don't get a mark just because you walked through the door. Downgrade. They, they have a minimum attendance, 80%. They, they don't meet that, they get downgrade. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, we have odd things because for students who are on visas with us, they have to have an 80%. So we do have to track it. Um, and yeah, and then if they don't meet, we also have that kind of 80% mark. And different instructors have. Portation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and different instructors have different ways of approaching the whole attendance issue, too. I mean, I know for a while some um, instructors like told me what I should be doing is saying, you know, you could have up to X number of absences per term, you know, like three or whatever, without it affecting your grade. But then I found what students did is they kind of used the, like, get out of jail cards. You know, like, well, I'm only, I'm going to use my other two. You know, like, no, that's not really the intent is that, you know, everyone should miss three classes. It's, it's, uh, anyway, a little off the top here. Um, and uh, also have students work in small groups um, and to, uh, as I said, you know, identify the important elements in a strong essay. Um, and then I have, usually have them work on the board um, and kind of, you know, just work out a whole schematic till they got something that we can all agree on, including me. Um, I'm part of the discussion of, you know, and then snap a picture of it, go type it up, and it's the rubric we use for that paper. Um, and then they do self-reflective things. How well did they think they adhered to, you know, the rubric? And did they find anything that was hard about it once they actually wrote the paper and then looked at the rubric and thought, oh, you know, I don't think that category really works that we came up with, and why? And it really gets into this kind of nice meta discussion of writing um, and what are the elements of good writing, um, as opposed to uh, putting the responsibility for grading just as it's like some black box that goes off to the instructor and magically some score comes back and they either love it or they hate it, um, and uh, but gets them more deeply involved in the process. Um, and then the continuation of this is yeah, to specify the category standards and then finally to use it and identify areas for improvement for refining the rubric for the next paper. So this becomes kind of a class product as well. And I want to speed things up here a little bit. Um, I think actually, let me see something. Yeah, um, I'm going to imagine that this slide is before this slide. Um, <laughs> Because it's uh, like 326 is a good time for a little five minute stretch break if you look for some juice boxes and things, um, restroom down the hall. Um, so come back in about five minutes and we'll continue. Oh, no. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to have you imagine what this last slide said, which was portfolio assessment. Uh, and uh, so in conjunction with this rubric that students get and faculty use, um, the final product that our students have to pre present at the end of the semester is a portfolio of their best work over the semester um, presented on a website. Um, and these are actually private. Uh, you won't be able to go find these. Um, we have really strict privacy. Um, issues on our campus, and so we work specifically with this comp company not only to ensure that the sites are private, um, but that no student data is collected. Um, and because, of course, a lot of the freely available websites, the reason they're free is because they're gathering all kinds of data on Google. Um, so I just want going to show you very quickly um, two examples of um, the portfolio. The way we assess portfolios is we do collaborative assessment. So um, 
one instructor is reading other instructors' students' work. Um, that word is semi-final. <laughs> it's mostly final. Um, however, the instructor, if they disagree with the rater's assessment of that portfolio, can kind of raise an objection with me, then I do an additional rating of that portfolio to either confirm or deny uh, what the assessor had to say about it. Um, so this, uh, I'll drive here for a bit. Uh, so each portfolio uh, has to include um, reflective pieces. And this is a really important part of our assessment is that students assess their own work Let me see if I can. Um, uh, in ongoing reflection throughout this semester as well as end of semester reflection on their improvement. Um, this one's kind of brief, um, but it's supposed to talk a little bit about their um, literacy background, you know, where they uh, come from uh, in terms of language development. Um, what they worked on over the semester. Um, a lot of uh, students, you know, take the opportunity to um, talk about how hard the class is, uh, but, you know, that they were really pleased with their uh, results. Uh, so, uh, this is a, just an example of a student reflection. Has everybody gotten a chance to kind of read, at least, you don't have to read the entire thing, but um, get the, the idea. And then uh, they choose three to four of their best papers from the semester uh, and write a reflective piece about the individual papers. And sorry, this is that's actually not so bad on the screen. On this screen, it's not that easy to read. Um, next semester, we're putting together a style guide that says no more white text against glittery backgrounds. Uh, <laughs> But um, then the reflections on each of the port each of the pieces talk about what they might have struggled with um, in that particular piece, what was challenging for them, what they learned and improved, and so forth. So, you know, this student says, "I paid close attention to the poems, titles, figurative li literal images, etc." Um, and then. Uh, Paper itself, which, uh, what do I want to do with it? I want to open it. Which they can do in PDF or Word format, and then it just looks like very much like kind of a traditionally written paper. Um, so they can have fun a little bit, maybe a little bit too much fun with the formatting of the site and the reflective things. The papers um, will look very as I said, very traditional. Um, and so it comes, it's a nice blend of these different approaches. So there would be three of these papers. We have these requirements um, that a certain percentage of the work that's in the portfolio has to be analytical in nature. Um, usually one piece can be less academic if the student chooses. Um, they don't have to, but if their instructors say assign a personal narrative or something more creative, they can choose to include that, but only after the other requirements are satisfied. Um, at our university, I mean, I know personal narrative has like various bad reputations among you know academics in certain uh, areas and things, but at our university, actually, it's used extensively across campus. Um, not just in the writing program, but um, even in the math department, for example, students keep learning journals um, and um, reflect on their process of learning uh, various types of math and things. And students are often very disappointed to hear this. They go into math so they don't have to write, and then they have to keep journals, um, so they're a little dismayed. But actually, I think it's a great practice. So that's just a little bit of what I wanted to say about um, that. And I'm going to go back to um, the next step, which is actually having you uh, do some of the workshop part of the day. Uh, so uh, 
I'm going to be sharing with you some student papers, uh, and you're going to have some specific things to do with them. And you'll do some things on your own, but then talk about it in the group. Um, but one of the things is, um, while I do have permission to use these papers, I don't have permission to make them public. So please don't, you know, make copies for your teacher trainees or things like that. Um, so we're going to start with paper one. They're short. So I know you've all been marking and things, so the idea of like doing more marking is probably what. Um, but yeah, these are very short. Um, these are written in, uh, these are in-class essays you're going to see, so they're less polished than what you just saw in the portfolio. Yeah, these are these. This is written in class. And it was written, you'll figure out, uh, written to a specific piece of reading. Um, in response to it. So, your first task you. for paper one. So, please read it and comment and mark as if it were your own student. Do what you would normally do with one of your student papers. Um, and then, um, once you're all done with that, you can talk amongst yourselves what principles guided your marking or commenting scheme. It's a short paper, so hopefully it won't take too long. Uh, you may not have gotten to discuss everything you want for this one, but um, given that we're at 4 o'clock already, um, and I only want to take about 20 more minutes with things, um, we're just going to do a second sample. I have three, but I think two is going to be fun. Um, so, but I would like to hear some comments on this. This group had some more questions about context of this writing, so I'll, I'll throw this out there and see if it affects any of the things you're thinking about. So the, number one, this is a placement instrument. Um, so students, this is a two hour um, sitting for this. Um, these exams um, are pulled from our statewide exam. So these are not necessarily Berkeley students. They might be students going to UC San Diego or UC Santa Barbara or one of the UC campuses, but it's all within the university system. So for those that may not know, Berkeley is one of 10 campuses of the University of California system. We're the oldest. We're the original, which is why we are often just called California um, or Cal. Uh, everybody else has to go by their name, but we're just California. Uh, but these were the 150-year-old campus. Um, our youngest campus is 10 years old, uh, UC Merced. Um, and so uh, each of the campuses you know, has kind of its own characteristic. This, this essay is written to determine um, what kind of writing classes the student needs to take. Uh, they, they're already admitted, so it's not high stakes in the sense that it's going to keep them from the university. But it is high stakes in the amount of time they're going to have to spend in writing classes. Um, and if they do well enough on this test, it can exempt them from the first semester of writing. So, um, so it's high stakes in that sense, in that it could save the students some time and money in their whole educational process. So that's the context for this. So thoughts about this paper and how you would, you know, what was your approach to assessing this? Any thoughts? Yes. Back. The consensus that we had was that during the first read it was very difficult to read, yeah. but uh, during the second read we kind of see why it was structured in the way it was. Um, although it looked more like a bibliographic essay than a, uh, you said, a summarizing and a reading whether it's, yeah, okay. So, we kind of felt that during the first grade it was more like a bibliographic essay, but then during the second grade we understand that it's more of an inductive kind of writing than a deductive kind of writing, and that towards the end the logic was clearer. Mm -hmm. um, but at the beginning it was like a to read mm -hmm. the first time. Yeah, yeah, and it's an interesting thing with this kind of exam um, because I train the readers of this exam statewide, and one of the issues we have to insist on is read carefully to the end. Um, because it's really easy with an essay like this to read the first half and go, ah, this, this is off the rails. I, you know. um, but 
I think you're right. It starts to pull itself together as it goes on, and we find this happens a lot, especially in class writing, in all kinds of circumstances. It's very hard for students to get started. Um, and uh, that's okay. Um, and, and so they, they're kind of thinking on paper, the first couple of paragraphs. Um, and then they eventually um, you know, come around to, oh, okay, here's what I'm trying to say. Uh, this group mentioned, you know, this would be great, like, looking at this as a first draft, um, because there are, there are some ideas to work with here. So, you know, you can imagine pro providing some feedback here to help the student go back and organize thoughts better, you know, provide that compelling, um, you know, idea um, for, uh, you know, organizing and pulling the reader through the argument, because it is hard to follow the argument of this paper. Um, to, and by the end, you start to see it, and like, but it does contradict itself a couple of times. So, other thoughts on this? Uh, depending on the student's educational background, I, I would guess that they maybe don't understand the nature of the task. That they, that they think that their task is to simply summarize the, mm -hmm. the writer's stance, and that it, you know, sort of to criticize the writer's stance is not their place. Yeah, that's a really good point, and um, I think often, you know, beginning level students have a hard time with the idea of, like, you know, oh, this woman, you know, she's an attorney, she is Harvard educated, um, you know, she's written books, and here I am, 17 years old, um, just out of high school, and you want me to criticize her writing or disagree with her in some way. And it is a task some students have a really hard time doing. Or they're told to critique, and they confuse that with criticize. Mm -hmm. um, because critique and criticize are not the same thing. And so they think critique means criticize, and they don't know how to do that or don't want to do that. Uh, or they do it falsely and find strange things to like pick apart. Um, we find that in some of these essays as well. Although they do refer to her as Susan. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's like another, uh, that's, a, that's a really common problem we have in like, getting students to use last names when they're citing rather than first names. Um, and we sometimes don't know if it's, um, I mean, we also have the same problem. We ask students to, like, you know, last name first and surname, and they often don't know what we're talking about, like which name is which. And so I think sometimes that using a first name instead of a last name comes down to they actually don't know which name is the first name and the last name. Yes. Um, presumably in university they're doing a lot of writing outside of class. Yeah. So I would expect your writing to be somewhat better than even class writing. So yes. Yeah, I mean the technological support. So. Exactly. So, you know, some of the spelling things that you see here, you know, if a student were doing it. I mean, this was originally done by hand. I retyped them. Right. So um, they don't have access to any They have tools. no access to any tools at all in their writing. Um, can't look things up on the phone or, um, and it, which actually kind of creates an artificial um, environment, in my opinion. But, you know, just one little boy. So, I mean, you know, nobody writes anymore without access to tools. And no one's expected to write. And the thinking process would be also very different because we're looking at that when we go back and forth. That may affect, you know, like creating like equity or validity issue. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, and I will tell you for students these days, and we're actually looking at this exam right now and seeing if we could be doing something better or different, but um, a lot of students, you, could, you might be able to imagine what they say about this exam at the end. <laughs> My hand hurts. <laughs> They're not used to writing by hand so much anymore, you know. And this is two hours of, you know, writing by hand. And you can imagine what the essays look like. I mean, a lot of them were crossed out, scribbled, numbered, arrows, and reading them is really a joy. Can they write? Like, you know, are they allowed to write the draft and then yes. write another? Yes, draft? they can if they, you know, if they have the time to do that. Um, you know, they just have to submit all their notes and revisions and things, but yeah, they can definitely, a lot of them usually write out an outline of some kind before they launch into writing their full essay. Okay, because um, we want to stop by like 4.20 to, yeah, or 4.25, oh, 4 yeah. so 
We'll give you the second one, and uh, thank you very much. one, um, if you can remember back to the idea of minimal marking, just putting check marks in uh, the margins of lines where you find problems uh, without any additional commenting, and then just totaling up um, at the end. So read through it um, and use the minimal marking approach and see what you think. Yes? Can we know a little bit? Yes, let me tell you a little bit about this one. Um, this one, I think, as you read it, uh, will be the, you know, a little clearer. That I think the writer makes it clearer what the original reading is about. Uh, but it was about the value of silence um, and you know how, as a modern society, we don't value silence much anymore. Kind of the ways that um, silence is used as punishment. You know, for example, you know, if a kid gets in trouble, go sit in the corner. You can't speak. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know what effect that has on us in our daily life. So, and again, they were supposed to kind of summarize the main points, agree or disagree, and bring in examples either from personal experience or from things they've read. Rush you, but we're already in almost twenty afternoons. Um, any thoughts on this one? Um, and on minimal marking, if you try it out, um, what do you see as sort of the pros and cons of this minimal marking approach? And especially, you know, what, what do you think is gained and what is lost in the process? It's quick. It's quick, yeah. absolutely. You can, if you have a large, you know, body of um, papers to get through, um, it, it's a fairly quick process. Um, but what does it really tell you? I mean, yeah, I marked a lot of errors here, but as we're saying, uh, what I call an error, an inappropriate word choice. Yes. We, we've decided, we, we, we like this, we've decided he's a very immature young man. Uh, we've imagined you know, he's about 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> he's more like 17. Yeah, he's oh, still immature. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but he's kind of cute, you know, he thinks it's his place to comment on the intelligence of the writer. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so inappropriate word choice, is, is that an error? Or do I mark them as an error? And then all these really short sentence structures, I mean, they're not errors, but right. they're very obvious. Yeah, and I mean, they, for me, I mean, I like the impulse behind minimal marking, the idea that, you know, draw students' attention to, you know, the issues and have them think it through and, you know, they're deciding. For me, the problem with it is they don't know what they don't know. So as you said, you know, what if you, it's not really a mistake, but maybe a word choice that really isn't very apt in the particular context. Um, will a student seeing a check mark there be able to, to identify in that line? Yeah, we'll see that, oh, it's, that's probably. So you know, the presumption is, of course, that you would sit down with the student. Um, but then, and this is just me, I, I actually like minimal marking. I don't use it a lot for these very reasons. It actually forces the individual conference. And so if you don't, you know, because students aren't going to like look at a check mark, I think, on the slide and say, oh, that's probably because um, I used, you know, uh, this word and not that word. I mean, if they knew the right word, they would have used it to start with, <laughs> right? Um, so then it would require, you know, if they can't fix it themselves or identify it, at some point, you're going to have to intervene and either go back and do the commenting you didn't do the first time, or sit down with the student and talk to them. In our context, our, student, our classes are capped at 14 students. 14, 14. Um, and um, with a maximum of two sec two sections is full time. Are they having a session? Room? <laughs> Teachers? I don't know what that means. Well, it means like pop time. Oh, part-time. <laughs> no, we don't hire part-time people. We, we commit fully to our faculty and hire full-time people. And as long as they do a good job, they get to stay. So, <laughs> I, this, uh, you know, I apologize for this, because I, I hear these phrases like pre-sessional and, oh, no, I didn't. 
Um, we have different terminology, I guess. Uh, but um, so uh, anyway, so back to yeah, the minimal marking. Uh, for me, what's lost is I think for those papers that are really good to start with, you zip through them really fast, right? Maybe there's one or two checks, and the student goes, oh yeah, punctuation. Oh, why didn't I see that first time or something? Uh, for the ones where you're checking two for almost every line, you know, where does it go from there? What's the next step? Uh, because I think just those check marks, obviously it's not enough. And the original intent of this process is not that that's enough. You know, you have to do follow-ups after that. You have to see what the student can identify, and then you have to go in and comment on things they didn't identify. Um, I still think it's worth trying. And if you've got a big stack of papers, um, you know, it, or I, most people I know that use this have modified it in some way to kind of fit their own style. I know one who underlined, does a single underline of things, um, you know, where there's an error, double up underline of things that are well written, and I think that's what's missing here, is the opportunity to point out what's done right. Um, and I think it's really important in response, and this will be my final word on responding to writing, since we're running out of time, um, is, is as important to point out to students what's done right and what's done well as what has not been done incorrectly or poorly. Um, because often, if you point out like the three places where the past participle is used correctly, and then there's one place where it's used incorrectly, it's going to make it a lot easier for the student to identify what's wrong. If you say, oh, you know, you use the past participle, you know, with all these verbs like perfectly in the first paragraph, but here in the second paragraph, you know, something went wrong here. Um, look at how you did it in the first paragraph. Why did you make these choices in the second? Um, and so I think positive, you know, I think minimal marking. For me, this is the opportunity for positive feedback, at least in the first round. It puts all the focus on what's done incorrectly. Uh, anyway. You can't look at anything bigger in the sentence. Yeah. Like discourse features, like paragraph structure. And yeah, and going back to you know our rubric, like I have a really hard time how I would relate our rubric to that. Because you know we're looking at this kind of holistic general impressions overall. How well, and yeah, the kind of nitty gritty check mark thing doesn't necessarily get at those kind of higher order. It's kind of distracting, actually. I, I, so I'm, I'm just marking, and, but then I'm yeah, losing sight of is there any overall argument here? Yeah. And, you know, coherence like this. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, like I said, there was a third paper, but we're out of time. <laughs> um, you want to take over? But thanks, everyone, for sticking it out. Um.